Hey friends, today we have Ralph Macchio on the show talking about his new book, Waxing On. We're talking all about his journey through the Karate Kid, Cobra Kai, everything in between. Ralph, anything yeah. to add? Yeah, it is. It's the um, it's sort of a celebratory look back at uh, the Karate Kid's place in, in film, pop culture, and my life, and touching on all other things in areas. Uh, it's been a joy to write it, and it's been just... Uh, an incredible journey for what is nearly 40. Yeah, I said it out loud. Okay, 38 years. Holy moly. But um, uh, thank <laughs> you. Um, I'm, I'm excited. All right, friends, don't forget to hit subscribe. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to Better Together. When you know better, you get better. That's what we do here every single day. And today we're going to get better with Ralph Macchio. He wrote a book called Waxing On, The Karate Kid and Me, and I loved it. I read it this weekend. Uh, But first, we'll start with our quote of the day, as we always do. Movies will always be movies, and you can never replace that feeling of when the lights go down and the images come up. That is from Ralph Macchio himself, Heel Squad. Welcome back. Very, very excited to be chatting with Ralph today. He's talking about his new book, like I said, Waxing On. And if you've listened to the show before today, you know that Kevin and I, my husband, are diehard Cobra Kai fans. We're Karate Kid fans. Cobra Kai is so bomb. It's it's so fun. And I'm really excited to chat with Ralph, perhaps give him an interview he hasn't gotten before because I've been a little kind of bummed by some of his interviews. I'm like, everyone's just focusing on ah, the fact that he still looks so young or, or, you know, um, I don't know. I'm like, there's so much to talk to him about. And there's so many stories in this book and, and a lot to be inspired by. I mean, this is somebody who, you know, came up and was, uber successful was like early 80s right yep and i forget when karate came kid came out officially don't yell at me unless you really know is it early 80s for i sure? know it was early 80s because that's what his career took <laughs> off because we were just looking because you're yapping me and i'm the one who should know more <laughs> no, than you we so that's just, why i'm like if i don't know we were just looking through all the dates that's why i knew so karate kid came out um in 1984 84 okay so he really succeeded in the mid 80s mm-hmm. right um, and a lot of people his in his time and age went down some really rough paths and he didn't. And so I want to know how he kept a good head on his shoulder to inspire anybody out there who thinks they can do this and keep a good head on their shoulder. I was one of those that was like, dad, I really, I swear I'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then also, you know, really being tied to a franchise like this and having, the hardships that he had in his career as well and how he navigated those. And so there's so many things I want to ask him about. Of course, I want to ask him about season six, but he had a really powerful conversation with Warren Beatty that, uh, oh man, you get to watch someone look back at moments of their lives when they weren't taking in information and and how they processed it then, how they would process it now, how it helped them. Um you know, he worked with Robert De Niro and um, was very close on some really big things. And the thing that helped him also kind of hurt him a lot of the way. Mm. And that's that's the rub, right? Like he was about to potentially star in this amazing movie with Sidney Lumet, but then the Karate Kid 3 was happening and he couldn't. And what people don't ever get to see is the behind the scenes of what is kind of challenging um, someone's career. And even though this made him, it also kind of stuck him in some ways. And so there's a lot I want to ask him about. I'm really excited. Um, But it's funny to see how it comes all full circle again later in life. And now Cobra Kai is like the hugest thing ever and super, super successful. Um, And so his career continues on. And, you know, it doesn't hurt to always still look young and fresh. And, of course, Kevin and I were Cobra Kai for Halloween this year, which was super fun. Anyway, uh, let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be chatting with Ralph Macchio. The book tour is is all new. You know, it's a a whole new world. Feels like a subculture, but it's not, I guess. It's just new you don't um but people are showing up it's just crazy it's like a little bit of a 
a rock tour, you know, yeah. you go and they scream, they jump up, they have their books, they wait online. Um, it's really kind of quite wonderful. And, um, you know, and due to the, the Cobra Kai of it all, it's not like I'm doing any re reunion tour from the 80s. It's contemporary and relevant and yet nostalgic. Right? Isn't that so cool? So. I mean, I saw your Instagram and there's thousands of people in the audience. I mean, it's major. So yeah. when they... Was it the book publisher that proposed the idea of doing a tour or was that your idea to do a tour? Um, no, it, it was definitely not my idea, but I understood, you know, the worth of it. And, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of competition in any kind of media, you know, certainly in the fall, which we they they wanted this book to be released in the fall. And it's, you know, the, sort of the pre-holiday time. So it's a crowded market, I would imagine. And and um you know, you use every advantage you have. So I have this halo of this just released season five of Cobra Kai and the Karate Kid universe now globally engaging all ages. It it seemed to make sense to sort of create, you know, in certain cities, a, a little bit of a so-and-so is coming to town kind of thing. And uh, and so I, I signed on at, at, at that point and understanding that that would be beneficial is sort of cut through all the noise of, um, you know, just like anything, you know, if you have a show that opens on a day that's against Game of Thrones and the Sopranos, you got to do some work. <laughs> yeah, no, it's so cool. I, um, I don't, I think, you know, I'm a diehard Cobra Kai fan, but yes, I do know that. Okay, cool. Cause I remember when I saw you guys at, um, you and William yeah, and restaurant. your writers at Craig's, I was like, yeah. Oh my God. And then my husband was like, why didn't you ask more questions? I'm like, honey, I'm not going to badger them at dinner. It was enough that we caused a scene. It was, listen, <laughs> we were more flattered and excited that, you know, we had attention from you, from you guys than, uh, so it was a two-way street. Let's put perfect, it that way. Perfect, perfect. Well, season five was amazing. And uh, we watch it instantly. I think like every other Cobra Kai fan, once it like hits, we all just mm -hmm. get to a TV and just, totally binge. Um, and so that fandom is, is so many ages now for you. It's, it's like mm -hmm. us, us fans of the past and then there's new fans. And I think you called it kind of multi-generational, right? Like parents are watching right. with their kids. So what are you seeing at the book tour? I mean, I was trying to like close up and see like if you're seeing the same yeah, kind of representation same, same type of thing it's really yeah it has become um listen the karate kid has never gone away even in you know the late 90s early 2000s certainly for me it hasn't you know it's it's one of those uh i'm, I'm connected to that role uh forever and i i embrace that and obviously the book speaks to that it's been you know a journey of walking in those shoes for nearly 40 years and and how impactful that character was and is and inspirational and sort of a part of, you know, a lot of our childhoods, if you will. And and now I have, you know, 12 and 14 year old kids who know who Mr. Miyagi is and want, want and ask me questions about him. And it's kind of uh, uh, really unique in that way. And so on the book tour, we uh, and a lot of the people, the bookstore owners that sponsor these book tours in each city. That was a, a big part of their comments that they haven't seen that before. Well, they'll see, you know, someone in their a couple in their 50s and uh, and uh, kids in the college age and in their 20s and then 12 and 14 year old kids dressed up as the karate kid or or Johnny Lawrence, William Zapka's character or one of the younger generation cast from the show. A lot of, you know, a lot of uh, Daniel LaRusso wannabes from. 10. I mean, I've seen that I mean, some woman had like an infant with the headband and the white <laughs> robe on, you know, and uh, it's so it's it's become a little bit like a Marvel Cinematic Universe. It's You're like, right. It's a little, you know, it's it's really sort of like you, uh, it's not Captain America and Iron Man, but in a way it has that oh, kind yeah. of embrace. Yeah, you'd have your own Comic Con kind of thing for sure. Yeah, right. right. So right. I spent my Saturday with you, <laughs> just mm -hmm. me and your book. Oh, that's and great. Thank you. It was so great. Um, there were so many great things about it. First of all, you know, getting to hear your journey to becoming 
um, LaRusso and the Karate mm-hmm. Kid and all of that. But, you know, even, and then, and then the, at the end, hearing, you know, your conversations with Warren Beatty and being up in mm-hmm. that Sidney Lumet movie. So there's so many things I want to cover today. And I definitely got a little frustrated watching some of your interviews with some of my favorite people, by the way. Mm-hmm. Where I'm like, why does everyone just say the same stuff? It is. You're can, exactly right. Can we talk about something different? Yeah. Well, it's because it's, listen, you got your six minutes or yeah. eight minutes or whatever you, you get. And, um, and then, and then obviously there's a lot that tied into, and cause I talk about this in the book that there is on YouTube, there is videotape of my first audition of Pat Morita's first audition of me and Elizabeth Shue for the first time reading a scene together. So obviously for the visual, they all ran to that. So there was yeah. a whole lot of talk, which about is adorable that. because when you say you can see it on YouTube, I was like, no, I don't want to put the book down. Then I'm like, oh, but, screw it. I, but I want to see yeah, it. So I did. I'm one of the, <laughs> I, my, I was joking the other night uh, that, that my my book comes with visual aids. Uh, not only the movie, now you get behind the scenes visual aids. Mm-hmm. Um, but but yes, you're right. Uh, very often, um, you know, when you have your six minutes on whatever talk show, you it's kind of... It's limited. I won't say the low-hanging fruit, but you, you know, it's all the top, the top hits and not as much the deep cuts and the dives in, into the areas of the book that that may be fresher, newer, more interesting and untold, certainly. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll get to some of that. So what I found fascinating was one of the things was how the director of the Karate Kid, John Avildsen, is that how you say his name? Avildsen, yeah. Avildsen. I I knew there was something that was missing in there. Um, Really was immersing you in this world, like, I, like he knew he was making like a masterpiece. Like that's what it feels like. I mean, he's high. What was the high recording, the videotape called that he was using the camera? Uh, a high, probably a JVC, you know, the t- it was I'm thinking like, of like a hi eight or something. He's like, yeah, it was sort of like that. He was filming your every move, wherever every move. you were off camera before you even had the role. Exactly. Well, listen, if I, the last time I had dinner with him years uh, years later and, and years back, uh, he was still videotaping. I said, Did you, I'm just ordering. We don't have to shoot that. Stop he, it. He was, uh, that was just, he was a camera. He just visualized, he's loved to have the footage. And then he would edit it at night. He was a true filmmaker, you know? Oh. Um, yeah. I mean, that was part of what I do write to that when I, when I came into uh, read for, for the Daniel LaRusso role, he had the camera, he had it like this the whole time. He was just holding it and he had the pages on his lap. And even when he was explaining the role to me um, before we started reading, he was just shooting that. And it was at first I was a little self-conscious of it at that point. And I kind of didn't understand why shouldn't we just like put the camera up when it's time to read the scene? Um, I didn't question him. He had won an Oscar for Rocky. I figure he knew what he was doing. <laughs> um, uh, but later, you know, as you you think back, I think back on all this stuff. That's been the beauty of writing the book. It's actually looking at those moments and coming back from a point of, for lack of a better description, wisdom or have living lived longer and understanding. He was just capturing behavior and 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 the part that wasn't the acting part that gets all, you know, you get all up and you you want to give your performance. And so I think uh, you're equally. The audition is equally the conversation beforehand, and then obviously you still need to deliver the performance. But um, but even when so. you weren't auditioning, he was filming you. Yeah, all, all the time. And then and it was like a boot camp for you to become the Karate Kid. I mean, he was not only immersing you in the train; like he was just it was like a full court press. Like for this to succeed everybody's got to be a billion percent in yeah, that's all how day, he, every day. He was, he was a stickler for all that stuff, for the rehearsing, the, the martial arts, for the bike, you know, riding the BMX bike. I never got great at it. He he had me work with this wonderful guy who did all these tricks, and I just kind of sucked at it. I was just <laughs> like, I mean, soccer, I was okay. But all the little specialty moments, juggling the soccer ball, which was written into the script, and, and riding a bike, he wanted me to really be... It was interesting because I, I had met Spielberg not long before that for E.T. 
Um, and it was all about the first question is, how are you on a bike? How are you? Because ET, obviously, the bike was a big part of all these kids. Um, it was for one of the uh, friends, the roles of one of the friends. And um, and so then with Avilson, it was back, I said, back on this bike. Everybody needs you to ride a bike. You gotta, I knew how to ride a bike, but I didn't know how to do the tricks. But all that stuff and the training, the you know, just the physical training to get your stamina up. That was uh, as soon as I hit the tarmac in Los Angeles, I, he was I had my daily itinerary and I didn't quite have the part yet. I had the offer for an option, which is the, you know, and a screen test the, and a screen test. Basically, it's a screen test option. And it was a three picture uh, deal. So this was early in the, the, the days of locking up an actor when a studio felt they might have something that would go beyond the one entity. You know, so, you know, I liken it to like a, an Olympic coach. It sounds like he was like your ice skating coach. He, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you had to just wake up, eat, breathe, and sleep every part of this role till you showed him there was no doubt you could nail this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the, I think the acting part of it and the, is, am I the right guy for the part? That was easy. Right away. Yeah. Uh, for him. It was, but you can tell that from the audition. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And, and, and but I, I don't think he didn't think I'd be there physically. It was just about, you know, this is it. This has to be great. Because yeah. on the day, you know, and it was with Pat Morita and myself, especially with all those, you know, show me wax on, show me paint the fence and all those those chores that turned into moves. It turned into the big cheer in the theaters. Everybody so like, holy crap, that means this. And now he's, you know, it was the magic of of waxing a car and teaches you how to block, you know, and that that was that wish fulfillment element that was so woven so well into the script. That was the stuff he really pushed on because he said this has to be better, faster, quicker. And the fact that he had Rocky as his leverage point, I had I didn't have much of a leg pun intended to stand on yeah. to fight back. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was really cool to like you know just read and experience that through your eyes mm-hmm. and and then the casting of everybody and how that all came together um it was it was an intense process and then mm-hmm. you know to to um to see that nothing changed basically from your your audition to who you ended up on screen was also really cool it is really interesting. I didn't notice that till years later, till when I watched that tape. And I'm like, well, that's kind of the kid. Mm-hmm. That's kind of, it wasn't like, wow, that's where it started. And this is where it went. You could see those elements. Um, you know, a lot of that was just uh, me being natural me and kind of just amping up a little of the bravado and the the guy that won't take no for an answer and won't leave well enough alone. That's the biggest difference between Daniel LaRusso and Machio. I think if I, I always say if I got my ass kicked by five motorcycle riding karate experts, I probably would have n- not gone back. I yeah. probably would have said, you know what, maybe I'll hang out over here. But that doesn't make for as much fun of a movie. So what's also crazy is just kind of how this whole franchise has gone. So you sign on for all three, you have no choice. Mm-hmm, correct. And, um, and of course, you know, now it's got its complete resurgence, but there's so much that happened after the first that could have taken your career in different directions. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and, it's frustrating and I can feel your frustration as you're writing about it. And I love the honesty of it all because right. when you're in the industry, we all understand that you're, you're locked and you can't be touched. And so even if you were going to have somebody that was going to believe in you and not the stereotype of, Oh, he's only known as this now mm-hmm. y- y- you can't escape it somehow. And right. you know, there's all these things and deals where you can't work for a competitor for a few months. And there's all kinds of stuff that no one ever gets to see. And right. so um, just reading about like Sidney Lumet wanting you to be a part of his movie and then it conflicting with Karate Kid 3. Share a little right. bit about that with everybody and kind yeah, of that's how a, that's a challenging story. that was. I, yeah. Well, that was, that was the most challenging time for me. Um, um, you know, and I had, I had, twofold things going on one it was a a very um um popular movie and um and 
And then I was in the contract, but more so, but on top, not more so, but in addition to, I was then now approaching my late 20s and looking young for my age. So it wasn't like I could, you know, go into my closet and come out, you go into my, you know, come come out of one season into the next and have, you know, grow, grow a full beard and have this sort of gr- gruff kind of, you know, I came out, I had a, a kid quality to me that I, I still kind of in a weird, odd way have, I have a youthful energy, um, you know, that just is who I am. And so, so the fact that I was aging slowly and attached to a part that was called a kid, it did not, uh, it did not help to branch out. The thing with, I was on Broadway with Robert De Niro and a play called Cuban is Teddy Bear. Burt Young was in the play as well, who played Paulie in the Rocky uh, films. Um, and so I was doing something that was just amazing and awesome. And, and this uh, was right after Karate Kid. This was after Karate Kid. Karate Kid 2 was in the movie theaters. Okay. Um, Crossroads was a film I did right before that. So that had just left Karate Kid 2. Was in, it was a big summer of 86. And, uh, and then Karate Kid 3 was on tap, um, even though I didn't know what the script was. And, um, you know, I had met Sidney Lumet a few times, uh, one of the great filmmakers, uh, when I think of Serpico and Network and Dog Day Afternoon, some of those great films of the 70s. And it wasn't, he didn't offer me a role in the film. And I was very clear with that in the book. He was considering um, and uh, and just the using that story, um, um, it was conflicting time wise with when Karate Kid 3 was slated. And so at the end of it all, River Phoenix played the role, spectacular, nominated for an Oscar. And I, I allude to this in the book a few times. In success, usually the right actor gets the, the right part. So I in no way had sour grapes about that. Um, and in essence, the, the production schedules uh, did not land at the same time it just the ship had sailed basically because when you could have been a part of it you couldn't because the production schedules were going to be the same exactly so then the sucky part is oh they weren't the same i could have done it right but the right guy wound up doing it that's the way i look at it i talk about matthew roderick as bueller i talk about you know michael j fox as mcfly i talk about myself as larusso it seemed that the right guys got the right parts. You know, that's how I look at it. And I don't, I don't get bitter about that. But at the moment it was, and I use that story. Um, there were some other examples of that, but I use that story as, um, because it bridges into the sort of the Warren Beatty story, um, which, which is, I want to hear. He came in, he came in on a day, uh, Cuban is Teddy Bear. Once again, I'm on Broadway. And because it was De Niro, everyone came to see the show. Um, no, I'll take a little credit for some people coming, but uh, between the two of us and Burt Young, we, you know, there's pretty good firepower on the stage. And, and, uh, the day that Warren Beatty came in, and I'm sure he has no recollection of this whatsoever. Um, but, um, I doubt it. And maybe he does. Maybe he does. Um, I bet he um, does. I was, I, what, what did you say? I bet he does. Yeah, he might. He might. You were a huge um, star. He was trying to mentor you. Yeah. He was just given, you know, he saw in me, uh, maybe, maybe a piece of something that he might have experienced back in his day, and was was uh, he came in? It was a I think it was a Sunday matinee performance, and he came into the dressing room, which was I was honored, but I was also in that mindset of uh, when he complimented the Karate Kid at the time. I was I sort of I didn't I sort of poo pooed it a bit at the moment. Because I was, um, I wanted to talk more about the play and about you know working with De Niro and all that stuff, and and he just, um, um, without going into too much detail, because I want people to read read the story, he basically gave me some some thoughts on 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 how you can uh, embrace both, and you don't have to have they're not mutually exclusive, um, and you can um, be open to all that you gain from a very successful film that reached a lot of people and um you know so i always likened it to the as if he was uh heaven can wait one of my favorite movies uh favorite warren Beatty movies when when he's trying to reach uh his best friend who doesn't recognize him because he is in another person's body and uh and i i enjoyed writing that a bit because it was weeks later i started thinking like 
it's almost like he was trying to talk to me and I wasn't seeing it. I wasn't seeing him, but it didn't take long after that for me to see that, that wisdom going forward. And that's why I've, you know, come to, to embrace it all, the good, the bad, the, you know, or the challenges. I want you can't really say anything that there's bad about Daniel LaRusso or the Karate Kid in my life. It's really, truly a gift that continues to keep on giving and a legacy that carries on in a world that may not always be so happy. Um, I get to spread a little bit of joy with this, this role. Absolutely. Well, it also is interesting because you didn't kind of experience some of the other things that people in Hollywood have experienced. You mm-hmm. always say you're the anti e true Hollywood story. Right, right, right. And it's funny because that's Daniel LaRusso, right? Mm-hmm. He was a good kid. And and so are you. You're a good adult too. Not just a good kid. You're a good <laughs> adult. Um, and so your your lives have those interesting parallels. So like when I talked to Stallone, I'm like, you Rocky Balboa was literally your life. Like it's your mm-hmm. parallel. Um, it, it's so interesting when you, when you can kind of see the characters and the real life kind of mirror each other in some mirror ways. Yeah. It's so, the blurred lines as I call it. Yeah. So do you see that? I do to, to a point. Um, um, and I think those, you know, the guys who create the Cobra Kai show also in, in essence have, you know, sort of written along those those lines, LaRusso, someone who's married, you know, uh, successfully has a wife that's got his back and, you know, two kids that are well adjusted, but going through the bumps and, and grinds. I mean, and, you know, the Cobra Kai of it all gets a little soap opera and that's just part of the tone of the show, which is awesome. Love so much. Yeah. People <laughs> love it. I mean, two people that are arguing about, you know, the karate in the Valley, like it really means something. Yeah. I always joke that if it was me, I would probably move and just take up a different sport and have a much easier life. Yeah. You know, but that, that doesn't make uh, for great entertainment. And, and so, so yeah, so there are those parallels. He has two kids. I have two kids. I've been married a very long time and LaRusso's, you know, married successful. They wanted to honor the happily ever after of it all for Daniel LaRusso. And then the the nose dive into misery for Johnny Lawrence. And then you flip that and that's the inroads to the Cobra Kai universe. Um, and then now it's kind of balanced out with season five, four and five with these, these guys. You love to see them. T- it's the Ross and Rachel of mm-hmm. our show is what uh, one of our showrunners would always say, you know, you love them together, but you love them when they're arguing too. And that's um, that dynamic works but very often once they get married the show's over so you have to keep that ball up in the air yeah um, but to answer your question there are similarities and differences you know that's a is a miyagiism different but same mm-hmm. you know you know um let me see what page was it was it 195 um where you talk about the times that you were frustrated with the limitations in your career um you know, I was saying before you came on, it's like the very thing that made you also created some limitations that were challenging. Yeah, yeah, created hurdles. What do you yeah. think helped get you through that? Was it Warren Beatty's advice? Um, no, not necessarily. I mean, it was good, sound uh, advice, but it wasn't. It was the fans. It was um, um, part of it's my own sensibilities. I never went so far down any dark place of frustration where I wasn't functioning. I was seeking it in a bottle or in a drug or in a, a, some kind of seductive something else that never, that's part of my upbringing, part of the, my, my relationship with my wife. That's been, you know, we've been married since 1987. Um, Since 87. 35 years. Wow. Crazy. God bless you guys. That's amazing. (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, who's got that story to tell? You know, so a a great deal of uh, um, credit goes to to that partnership. And um, and then I joke sometimes, sometimes I joke that all my sports teams in the 80s were doing well. So when I was in between jobs, I would fly back to New York to go to the Met games and to go to the Islanders Stanley Cup finals and so maybe if my team sucked i would have been aimlessly walking around sunset boulevard and wound up outside the viper room who the hell knows you know i I, 
Um, so some of it's the universe had a plan, right? If you think that way or not, but a decent amount is the foundation of 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 who I am and how I was raised. But it was the fans over the years that would come up to me and speak so earnestly and heartfelt about how much that movie meant to them, to their dad, to their mom, their brother. It's the one they watched with their grandfather all the time, and he was no longer there. or He was the Mr. Miyagi in their life, or they didn't have a Mr. Miyagi in their life. And this kid helped them with the bullying and under and felt like they could relate to that. And then now this is way bigger than anything else. It becomes it's where entertainment and media can actually make that different in, difference, especially in a fictionalized story when the characters are beautifully written got to credit the screenplay and presented, got to credit the director and the studio and everything else. Um, And then the magic of Pat Morita and that character that creates the wish fulfillment, the aspiration, the inspiration, you know, seeing that with, with adult men and women and kids when they would come up to me, which just happens all the time through even the frustrating years when I wasn't working as much. That kept the ball. That that's why the embrace um, mm. came instead of it being like, oh, I'm gonna you're gonna be on better together with Maria today, and 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 me tell my publicist, yeah, but I don't want to talk about that film. Okay, I'm mm-hmm. working on this now. Let's not talk about Daniel Larusso and Karate Kid. We that was then. This is now. That's BS to me, yeah. especially in this with this role. You know, I can understand certain actors. It's like they're always answering, like you mentioned, I'm on those talk shows with the same five minutes of the same questioning. Yeah. But um, you know the 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 fan. You know, you read the book. You know, I end the book. It's all about the fans. They they did not allow this character or this franchise to go away. Mm-hmm. The fans weren't there. Cobra Kai wouldn't work either. You need people to want to see it. Yeah. And the execution is super important. And that's what's worked two times with Karate Kid and Cobra Kai. Just beautiful, beautiful execution. What words of wisdom do you have for people who are down? Because, you know, you did talk about how there were really challenging times where you didn't know how you were going to provide for your family. Mm-hmm. How did you navigate those waters? Um, for me specifically, um, you know, my wife worked, um, so that, you know, that helped when I wasn't, the income wasn't the same, certainly. Um, I, uh, I was fairly, I guess the advice, <laughs> um, and it is, I was led pretty, mo- I, a pretty modest life all through it. I never, you know. I never bought the car I always wanted on the first payday. You know, I never, you know, I mean, I enjoy nice things, but it wasn't about that for me. So um, I was very conservative with my, with, with money. Even before, even when you were at your peaks? I think so. I, yes, yes. And I think that's part of, it goes back to the upbringing. I think that goes back to, I understood generally the value of a dollar my dad was a self-made man and successful and my mom and they're still together today god bless and they're in their early 80s and Mm. they are the two you know along with my wife and kids the most proud people you could imagine they were just at the book event in new york city and they you know it was just wonderful wonderful to share so i've been blessed you know i've had it i have that so it's always tough when you ask a question like this on how to hand out wisdom to to, to everyone, because not everyone has that same has dealt that same hand. Yeah. And so I've had that support uh, around me, but during those times when you are alone and it's just you or uh, just me and sitting there thinking about, you know, in the say the late nineties, I mean, my cousin Vinny had come and gone just a, to another terrific film that, that I still hear quotes about everywhere yeah. I go. Um, and um, and then, you know, the work kind of dried, the acting work dried up, and I dove into some screenwriting and tried to take what I learned from 
John Avildsen, Francis Ford Coppola, Walter Hill. I got to work with some of the finest filmmakers in in cinema, in American cinema, certainly. And so I made some short films, and that's what kept the creative juices uh, going. You know, one of them got into Sundance, it was sold to HBO. Those were little victories when the acting stuff wasn't wasn't on the forefront. So I was able to be creative, which is a it's a big part of fulfillment, but doesn't necessarily keep the lights on or the food on the table. So it was a balance. There's that word that is so woven <laughs> into the Karate Kid universe, but we could, you know, you could attest as well. Balance, it's important to uh, to have that in your life yeah. um, and strive for it. Well, and you, you had something that Mr. Miyagi taught you that I really, really loved. Let me see if I can mm-hmm. find one page. Um, I know you said your recipe for avoiding the pitfalls was one foot in, one foot out, but one then Mr. Out. Mr. Miyagi's lesson of walk on road, walk right side safe, walk left side safe, walk middle, sooner or later, you get squished just like a grape. Right, right. That's my one, you know, when someone asks me which Miyagiism do you, have you taken with you? And there's a, there's a few of them, but that is... Um, that's about making choices, owning choices, right or wrong. Um, they're yours, and you you uh, you know you you gain through that decision as opposed to stuck in the middle. Now, obviously, if you do a deep dive on that, if you make terrible choices and they hurt people, then it's then, then it kind of doesn't hold. That's extreme, water, but, but anything extreme. But that's extreme, right? So, uh, outside of something extreme like that, I do believe. Um, you know, and any time I waffle in the middle was when I uh, wound up with um, regretting it or wishing I did it, wish I made a choice. Mm-hmm. So that's just, a, I like to have that in the book, just even for a young reader to see, you know, who might be being pushed and pulled by peers or, or, um, or uh, peer pressure and stuff like that. And just try to, you know, make that choice and stick with it and own it, whether it, it works or not. Um, and that comes right from Robert Kamen's uh, screenplay for The Karate Kid. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's kind of what you did in that tougher period. You made a choice mm-hmm. to stay creative. Yep. And then yep, exactly. built on those victories. Yep. And and then William came to you with a short. He, I think what I remember him saying in the book was, um, I think there's still some more like left in these guys. Yes. Right. Yeah, so more, exactly. Which kind of is the precursor in a sense to Cobra Kai. Yeah. Yeah. No, he was way ahead of that, more ahead of it than I was. Um, mind you, if you don't have the great writers that you met that night, those yeah. three guys that are the biggest Karate Kid fans that really care so much about it. Um, if you don't have that and the execution and the wherewithal to see the, the next generation and the younger cast and how that builds in and how you mirror stuff from the original. I mean, they just do a beautiful job of mm-hmm. weaving uh, that. Um, then it's just an idea. And that's what it was with Billy and I. He had he had an idea, but never a fully fleshed out idea. Um, just just that there was room for these two guys because it's interesting. I mean, he could probably speak to it better than than I can but from his perspective of walking in the shoes of the proverbial bully even though some people thought the kick was illegal and <laughs> he's the real karate kid and it's in you know pop culture has so much fun with that and I addressed that in my theories and debates chapter yep. um um but walking in his walking in his uh Johnny Lawrence's shoes um you know there was and he's a very creative person and a filmmaker as well. Um, you know, he was able to see that maybe there's something here where these two guys come together in some way. To me, it always felt like a one-off idea. You know, okay, they're gonna have a rematch in their forties if, if that's what we were at the time, and it just seemed like an SNL sketch more than a fully realized work and narrative and so that's what I didn't want to do. I didn't want to just parody. They were already parodying parodying um the karate kid and you know, with sitcoms and snl and and uh all over because it's become such a big part of pop culture over the decades so i didn't want to just do the the easy one-off so it was always easier to say no thank you but at one point we got really close um literally right before the cobra kai guys came to us this the creators we were actually talking about 
doing something together for a short form content, maybe uh, like a, a branded content or a comedy central type thing, just little short excerpts of him and I, two opposites. And it would never came to to fruition, but it was almost at the drawing up the paperwork phase mm-hmm. to see if we could make it make sense. And then I said, wait, we should hold up. These guys have an idea. Let's listen to that. Yeah, well, Crazy. it's like you kind of put it out into the universe. Yeah. And at uh, that yeah. point, you guys had started doing some TV appearances together, like How I Met Your Mother. How I, How I Met Your Mother. Yeah, that was a little bit before then. Did and the writers and say that they saw that? Like, I wonder what the impetus they do, was for they, this. They, they, deny, they say it had nothing to do with it. Wow. I still, they, I still say to them, I say, you mean not even a little bit? Yeah. But they said no, because they were, for 10 years, they said they were trying to figure out how to get back into the Karate Kid universe. The difference is the only way to have done it would be a big tentpole movie, a two-hour thing with a big event, the mm-hmm. big climax at the end. And then it, they could never, um, um, once again, I'm speaking for them, but they it didn't make enough sense to to sell that or to get that sold. Where then when the, the, the streaming services of the world and the ability to... I think they said Fuller House was, they remember driving down Sunset and seeing the big billboard for Fuller House. And they said, wow, if you could do that, mm-hmm. maybe we could do this. So I think that's where John Josh and Hayden, who create Cobra Kai, came up with that. But the How I Met Your Mother of it all, which I mentioned a few times in the uh, in the book, was really, it was the beginning of all these comedy writer rooms, you know, I would so often hear this from comedy writers, TV writers. I mean, the Karate Kid would be quoted like all the time. It was like, you know, almost like sports analogies to, to these writing teams. And uh, credit them for taking their one of their leads in characters. And Neil Patrick Harris is Barney Stinson, that, of course, his favorite childhood film character would be the evil bully Johnny Lawrence and that he was truly robbed of his rightful victory by this skinny string bean of a kid from New Jersey. And it is, you know, and Neil delivered that so beautifully. And that was sort of the beginning of the me starting to see this subcultured theory, this underground, um, who's the real bully. And I write to all that stuff and it's kind of, uh, fun uh, in a way, it was like initially a, like this gut punch of like, what? I've been, you know, played this part that's been a hero for 15, 20 years. And now all of a sudden, certain people are picking it apart. Um, it's that mixed with, oh, my God, people are talking about a movie I made 20 years ago, which only means that this movie still means something to people. And that's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, season six. Has it been green light yet? I couldn't it has anything. not. Why? I, you know, I'm every day I'm waiting. Why? Um, <clears throat> I think this is just crossing the T's and dotting the I's okay. between, you know, the, the television studio that produces it and Netflix who licenses it. Um, we don't need to be I, worried. You know, there's all discussion <laughs> that we're moving forward. I mean, okay. you folks, our fans are just like, come on now, stop toying with us. Um I think there's more story to tell. The guys have more story to tell. I don't have any details specifically. Um, you know, we collaborate on all this stuff, but it really comes out of the writer's room. And um, hopefully any day soon, and, you know, we get that word and then get it out. There's also a big strategic thing with Netflix on when they make those announcements mm-hmm. and how, how they, you know, it's all part of the promotion package. But um it is not officially greenlit, but we are hopeful to say the least. Is it written? That we're in pretty good shape. Say that again. Is it written? It is not written. Oh, no, okay. no. So the guys are working on another show right now. Uh, the creators of Cobra Kai, they're in the probably, I think they finish up uh, soon, probably in November sometime. Um, and then they have to edit that show and you have the holidays. And I think... I think the goal is if we get a pickup to get started right after the first of the year and the writing process. But, you know, I get, I have nothing, I have no concrete info. So I keep telling people, you know, keep watching and tell your friends and keep it going so we could keep doing what uh, we love to do and what you guys love to watch. Yeah. It's, you know, I'm sure they have ideas of how, where it can go because you watch it and you're like, where else can it go? I don't know. Like how many times are they going to fight? Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
Um, but because it is so opera y, I mean, mm-hmm. you can. There's always a door that closes. There'll be one that opens next to it, and and another. They're really great at that. And uh, and there's even stuff we had. Uh, some every season of the show has a few scenes that don't fit because we just have too much and we wind up punting that to the next season. So there are a few things that are, that they held back uh, and putting that were intended to be toward the end of season five, that they're holding to, to advance more story for season six. They are very smart. Do you find yourself mentoring the young actors? I do a little bit. I I enjoy that. I think, I think I even mentioned that in the book that I really enjoy you know, just just talking a little bit about how it all was for me and the, the Pat Morita of it all. And that sort of they really lean into hearing those stories because they almost it feels like I feel like they take ownership and helping carry that torch forward. But um, um, I, I didn't expect that as much. And I think it's a credit to these talented young actors that are that are very open to it. I mean, it does trickle down. Like if Billy and I coming in to this show is the, you know, the, the, um, you know, the, the, the two that hold up the tent, if you will, and the concept of the Cobra Kai series. And we did not set this standard for that openness. Um, I think, you know, that would, I think it does trickle down in a way, but we also talk every day about how much we get, how um, amazed we are with these kids and how hard they work and how awesome they are as actors. And now how big of uh, stars they're becoming. So it's really no one, everyone cares. And I think that's why the Cobra Kai series works so well in the whole karate kid, you know, journey uh, people, the right from the writers down through the crew and, and certainly these young actors, no one feels like, you know, they're the shit, you know, it's their thing only. They know they're walking on kind of sacred ground that was, you know, built the foundation is there. So they want to honor that and and help carry it forward. And that that really I enjoy talking to them about that and giving some little pieces of how I move forward with everything um, and try to like even with this book at the end of this book, I think you get that, you know, I, I realize um you know, I embrace what what uh, what this all has meant to me in my life and career. And I think they take that. And maybe if they take just a little piece of that going forward in their very what will probably be very long, uh, successful careers, then maybe they take a little piece of something that I learned in a good way. Yeah. You know, Do you think that, that I mean, has have other things happen? Obviously, you have the book and the show, but. Is it giving you a new um, kind of resurgence in in the acting world? Is are there other things you're going to pursue right now too? Yeah, I mean, I'm hoping for that. Listen, I mean, I'm I'm playing a, a role that I played, even though he's a totally different role because he's a man with children and uh, responsibilities and, and no flaws. longer a kid. He's a dad. Yeah, right, right, exactly. <laughs> But uh, in the industry, you constantly have to, you know, recast yourself in, in the decision maker's eyes. We have a few scripts right now we're, uh, you know, out with and shaping and and some unscripted things as well. And obviously the book is something new and maybe uh, I have other ideas to write in the future, maybe even in di- different genres, be it, you know, children's books or young adult or, uh, you know, another memoir type of thing. Who knows? We'll see. We'll see how this one does. And I appreciate the time with you to uh, to get the word out there. It's really, you know, it's been a, this is so easy to talk to you. It's really awesome. Oh, thank you. Well, I loved the book and I know anybody who gets it is going to love it. Um, again, it's called Waxing on the Karate Kid and Me. We'll put the links to buy it and to find Ralph in the summary of this episode. He's so wonderful. He's so sweet. Isn't he the nicest? Just like such a calm, kind person. I was like, wow, I could just sit and listen to you guys forever. It was so, I don't know why I didn't expect that. He's just really so zen and calm. I was like, you're such a good guy. Well, that's why I feel like there's so many parallels Yes. I feel like he has Mr. Miyagi cemented in him. Like the teachings, the lessons, 
And um, what an incredible example for anyone who, you know, is scared to send their kid to Hollywood and to be in this industry. I mean, there's no perfect recipe. It's really, really hard. But um, he really kept his feet on the ground and really... um, and really navigated it all really well, or as well as you can, I think. I agree. And he's, I mean, he, he just seems like so down to earth. I mean, him and his wife being married for yet 30 plus years, which, and we read this, we were telling Maria, his grandma introduced the two of them, I which mean, I just die for. How cute. So cute. Yeah. He just is such a great guy. But I feel like, like such a connection because, you know, Kevin and I have been together uh-huh. for, Forever. Oh my gosh. I think it's 25 years now. Yeah. Um, I think we missed our anniversary. We missed our <laughs> wedding anniversary too. Like not just when we got together. Our wedding anniversary was last month and my brother and my dad were like, we're so sorry we missed it. I go, so did we. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, thanks for the reminder. Because <laughs> we had two weddings. So it's a little confusing. Anyway, um, I think that having Kevin the entire journey through here grounded me and kept me safe as well. If you're single... And you're all over the place. Like, it's hard, right? You're going to be very um, hard, very vulnerable, I think, to things. And so I always had that grounding force with Kevin. And it sounds like he had that grounding force with his wife. And yeah. so it's pretty cool. It is cool. Yeah. Anyhow, friends, you will love the book. I loved it. I couldn't put it down. Um, and we will put all of that in the summary of the episode. And yeah, if you haven't hit subscribe please do so you don't miss a great episode. We're here every single day. In the meantime, be nice people, make good choices, and be present. So, This podcast and all related content published or distributed by or on behalf of Maria Menunos or mariamenunos.com is for informational purposes only and may include information that is general in nature and that is not specific to you. Any information or opinions expressed or contained herein are not intended to serve as or replace medical advice, nor to diagnose, prescribe, or treat any disease, condition, illness, or injury, and you should consult the healthcare professional of your choice regarding all matters concerning your health, including before beginning any exercise, weight loss, or healthcare program. If you have or suspect you may have a healthcare emergency, please contact a qualified healthcare professional for treatment. Any information or opinions provided by a guest expert or host featured within website or on company's podcast are their own, not those of Maria Menounos or the company. Accordingly, Maria Menounos and the company cannot be responsible for any results or consequences or actions you may take based on information or opinions.